Okay, g'day all. Uh, welcome to another welcome to another video. Uh, today we're looking at a, uh, a particular XOR bit hack. So XOR is a bitwise instruction. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, check out the Wikipedia page probably. Uh, it's extremely useful. It comes up a lot in computer programming, this particular operation. Uh, it's used for data encryption, setting variables to zero, uh, even doing backups, like 100 megs of data can be backed up into 50 meg of space, which is quite cool. Uh, but it's also used in countless of the so-called bit hacks. And today we're going to look at just about the most famous bit hack of them all, or infamous, depending on uh, your point of view. Uh, this is one of the most clever and elegant bit hacks as well. Okay, I'm talking about the famous XOR swap. Uh, a lot of programmers know about this trick, uh, but they choose not to use it, and there's some really good reasons for that. So it's unintuitive and difficult to read in code. Uh, it can be dangerous. It doesn't always do what you'd expect. And uh, it's also slow, often, for a modern computer to do, for a modern CPU. Okay, but we're going to look at it anyway. Before we look at it, I think, I think we should describe the problem. So it's pretty simple. What you've got is uh, two integers, A and B, for example. Uh, maybe they've got 56 and 89. They can have other values. <laughs> this doesn't just work for 56 and 89. Uh, but the objective is to swap their values. So we want the uh, A variable to have 89, and we want the B to have the 56. So how would you do that? Um, it's, it's pretty tricky. If you've not done it before, it's pretty tricky. Uh, but there we go. So this is just about the most uh, common way to do this. And uh, I've got Visual Studio open over the side, and we can step through this code. Uh, so the most common way to do this is generally to use a temporary variable. This is mostly uh, the solution that you'll see if you look at other people's code. Uh, let's just hit play and step through this uh, algorithm as we um, examine the watches on those variables. So A at the moment, this is where the CPU is up to. It's just about to execute that instruction there. Um, A at the moment has 56, B has 89, and the temporary variable TMP has 0. So if we step over that first line, we get uh, the, the value of A copied to temp. Yeah, so temp equals A. Uh, we step over the next line, and uh, A gets whatever B has. So uh, A and B at that point have the same value. A has officially swapped its value with B, so the uh, A has 89. Uh, but quite happily, the uh, temp variable still had the original A value, so we can then uh, copy that into B. And hey presto, we've got ourselves a swap which is exactly what we wanted to do, but that's not the XOR swap. Alrighty, moving right along, uh, if you happen to be in x86 assembly, there's a really good way to do this, and I'll just make it down here as a little example. So we've got um, 56 in EAX, I'm going to use registers instead of uh, memory, and uh, 89 in EBX, something like that. Okay, I'll put a break right there and we'll hit play. Um, okay, so this is the exchange instruction. This is an instruction that's sort of, you know, inherent in the CPU itself. Um, hold on a second, we better add watches for EAX and EBX. Uh, okay, so there's our registers down there. EAX has 56, EBX has 89, and if I step over this single instruction, bang, there you go. It does exactly what we thought. It exchanges the values. Um, so there is a single x86 instruction that does exactly what these three lines do. So if you're in uh, assembly um, or some really low level language like that, uh, you might want to use the exchange instruction. Okay, but another alternative. So we're not in assembly anymore. We're back in uh, regular C++. But let's say that we don't want to use a temporary variable. Maybe we're running out of memory, so uh, we want to do this swap in just A and B, so no temporary variable. Now, well, this is another alternative, and this is actually getting really close to the actual XOR swap, but it's a bit different. Uh, this is called the arithmetic swap. So if I just copy these three lines over here, we should be able to put a few semicolons on there, uh, stick a breakpoint, and let's have a look at how this works. The arithmetic swap. Okay, so we don't have temp anymore. We don't have EAX and EBX. Alright, so we're at the first step of the arithmetic swap. The uh, variables are set up as they were before, 56 in A and 89 in B. The first step is to add them together and store them in A. There you go, so 145 is what you get when you add 56 and 89. 
but what's interesting about 145 is that if we subtract 89 from that, we get back our original A value. Um, so that's what this B line here does. There you go. So the original A value was 56. If we set B to that, uh, hey presto, B has uh, swapped places with A. Uh, and now the really, really clever line is probably this last one, I think, with the uh, arithmetic swap. The original B value was 145 minus 56. Yeah, since we added 56 and 89 to get that value, 145. So if we subtract 56 from what A has at the moment, we should get back our original B value. And there you go. So we've swapped the two uh, integer variables A and B using the arithmetic swap. Okay, so that's a really good idea because there's no temporary variables used at all. So it's, you know, it's, it's pretty good for uh, saving memory. Okay, but we do have to uh, point out some problems with the arithmetic swap. Um, the biggest problem with the arithmetic swap for x86 CPUs is this middle line just here. Uh, it's not fast, and the reason is because that's actually more than one step for the CPU. It looks like a single line of code in uh, C++, but it's actually more than one step. Uh, the reason is that the uh, CPU has to use its sub instruction, which uh, you know, is used to subtract integers. Um, but the sub instruction is a bit peculiar in that if you subtract B from A um, with the sub instruction, you've got to store your answer in A. Um, yeah, so this line just here asks us to do exactly that, only store the answer in B. So, uh, yeah, you can't use a single sub. The CPU is actually going to do more than one step there, yeah, since that's impossible in one step for an x86 CPU. Uh, it's actually not impossible on um, other architectures like ARM. And we also have the x87 uh, FPU, which could possibly do this line here in a single step. It's got a reverse subtract operation, but um, realistically, you're not going to copy your integers to the FPU. That's, <laughs> that's just going just gonna to slow you down more than anything. Um, okay, so I didn't mention it, but with the arithmetic swap, you can actually use other operations. It doesn't have to be plus and minus. Uh, you can use multiplication and division, or your powers and square roots, any two operators that are related to each other in that kind of opposing way. Um, you don't want to use multiplication, though, and uh, powers, because you'll probably overflow the integers. Yeah, And that overflow doesn't happen to matter with addition and subtraction, uh, but it definitely does matter with uh, multiplication or powers. Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on to the XOR swap itself. Here we go. So this is going to look really weird if you've not seen it before. Uh, this is the XOR swap. So I'm actually going to write this out in full. Uh, over here I've used a sort of C shorthand, but we'll write it out in full. So A equals A XOR B. I'll just paste those three lines, but make sure I get them right. Uh, yeah, there it is there. Um, that one's actually going to be that. Not that it matters, as we'll soon soon see. Okay, so if you've not seen this before, this is going to look really, really weird, and you're probably scratching your head trying to figure out why on earth these three lines uh, would do anything like swap the uh, values of A and B, but let's just step through first of all and have a look. Uh, okay, so A equals 56, B equals 89, and we're right at the first instruction of our amazing XOR swap. Let's see what happens. Alright, I step over the first line and A gets 97 for no apparent reason. I step over the second line and B gets 56 from absolutely nowhere. <laughs> and I step over the last line and hey presto, we've done the swap. Um, A gets 89 for no apparent reason from uh, absolutely nowhere. Okay, so we've swapped the three variables using uh, three XORs. And uh, the question probably is then, uh, why does that work? So let's just go to the next slide. Why does that work? Um, I think it's important that uh, XOR has two particular properties here that sort of explain why it works. So for one thing, XOR is commutative. Uh, commutative, I mean, I should say um, my T properly if I'm trying to explain something. Which means that uh, something like A equals A XOR B is exactly the same as A equals B XOR A. Yeah, it's commutative, so it doesn't matter what order the operands come in. A, X, or B, same number as B, X, or A. Exactly the same number. And the second property that's interesting about XOR is that if you XOR with the same value twice, you get back your original value. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means that if we say A equals A, X, or B, 
and we repeat that twice in a row. That's uh, XORing A with the same value twice. Um, what we'll see, hopefully, is uh, first of all, with the first XOR, A will get that, uh, uh, that strange value we saw a minute ago. 97, there you go. But if we XOR 97 with 89 again, we'll get back our 56. Yeah, there it is. Uh, so we're XORing A with the same value twice. B in this instance. Okay, and those two properties are alone uh, enough to uh, explain what's happening here. So the first line, we XOR A with B and uh, store the result in A. And uh, the second line is probably the interesting one. It reads B equals B XOR A. I might just swap those around. Uh, XOR is commutative, so I can. <laughs> Um, okay, so now it reads B equals A, X, or B, which is exactly the same as before, except um, what we can notice is that A was actually already A, X, or B. Yeah, so A was A, X, or B because of the last line, A equals A, X, or B. And what we see now really, really clearly is that A, X, or B, X, or B. Yeah, so we've XORed the value of A, the original value of A, which was 56, with B twice. Yeah, so if you XOR 56 with 89 twice, what do you get? You get 56 because of this second point down here. Good stuff. And for exactly the same reason, uh, this final line here makes sense as well. So A uh, actually equals um, that... A, X, or B. Uh, but at that point, B has already, because of this line before it, become the original A value. Yeah, so this final line here is basically like saying this. Um, A equals A, X, or B, X, or A, which uh, is the same uh, because of the commutative property as uh, just XORing B with A twice. Yeah, and if you XOR B with some value twice, what do you get? You get B back again. Yeah, so that's kind of my description of why it works. Uh, but let's just move along uh, to some practical applications. Okay, so when would you ever use this? Uh, there's a few good reasons to use this. For one, if you're working on non-x86 hardware, so hardware without an exchange instruction, uh, and you've got really limited registers or memory, uh, maybe it's a microcontroller, the XOR swap might help you out. Uh, likewise, if you're using SIMD instruction sets, they don't actually have the exchange instruction. So if you're working with uh, SSE or MMX or something like that, uh, the XOR exchange, or the XOR swap is um, yeah, a pretty attractive alternative to the exchange. Um, another good thing, if you're using SIMD, you can't accidentally zero registers. You know, registers don't have memory addresses, so you can't accidentally zero things. Um, let's just move on and have a look at the problems, which is um, pretty much the description of why you might accidentally zero things. Okay, so the problems with the uh, XOR swap. Maybe the, maybe the most important problem to point out is that uh, if, if you try an XOR swap pointers, and uh, they happen to point to the same place, so something like this, um, int star A and int star B. Uh, if you try an XOR swap your pointers with uh, star A XOR equals star B, and whoops, B and A. Uh, something strange happens. So let's have a look. We're going to call that function up there, XOR swap, but we're inadvertently, probably accidentally, going to pass uh, exactly the same value. Okay, so right here we're saying swap A's 56 with A. I think, you know, in some strange sense, logically, you should just get 56. You know what I mean? If you swap two variables and they both have 56, it's reasonable to suspect that you'd get 56 in both of them. Uh, so maybe you'd expect you'd get 56 from the XOR swap, but if we step through it, I think we'll see something pretty funny. <laughs> well, you're going to have to set a watch on it, aren't you? Come on, bro, wake up. Okay, we'll try that again, only I'll set a watch on uh, A star. Out of watch. Okay, so A star at the moment is 56. Not surprising since uh, we set it to 56 just a minute ago. <laughs> uh, but after the first line, A uh, star A X or star B, bang, we get zero. Yeah, and uh, 
not only is uh, is star A set to zero, but because star B actually points to exactly the same address, uh, star B is zero. So for the uh, remaining two instructions, we're just XORing zero with zero, which gives us a rather surprising uh, output of zero. Yeah, there you go. So the XOR swap, if you uh, try and swap exactly the same address, uh, will actually zero the address. And uh, that's used in... Um, computing all the time. If you want to zero a register, you'll often see something like um, XOR EAX EAX. Yeah, you XOR one value with itself to uh, zero things. Anyway, it might be a bit of a problem if you're trying to write a function to XOR swap, and the common solution around that, and this I think is presented on Wikipedia, is um, if A equals B, well sorry, if A doesn't equal B, then uh, proceed with your XOR swap. Yeah, so just put a guard at the top of your XOR swap function and you should be right. I think the main problem with that is just that this is a branch here and uh, we don't really want a branch. Branches are slow and, you know, just putting that branch in alone is enough to completely make the uh, XOR swap slower than just about any other method you could possibly try. Um, okay, so another problem with XOR swap is it's not as fast as exchange. Uh, it is just about as fast as exchange, but only if you can break up the dependency chain. So... Each of these instructions here um, depends on the results of the last instruction. Yeah, so this top one here, the instruction has to be finished by the CPU uh, before this second instruction operates. And likewise, the third uh, instruction of the XOR swap, the other two uh, previous instructions have to be completed by the CPU. And uh, that's, no, that's no good on a modern CPU, since a modern CPU, whenever it can, will actually execute instructions in parallel. And, um, yeah, we're sort of defeating the uh, CPU's ability to do that here. So you want to break the dependency chain by putting in, you know, random things down here that have nothing to do with A and B. But in so doing, you make your code completely unreadable. So if there's, you know, an XOR swap interleaved with some other instructions, well, it becomes pretty hard to read and really hard to debug and maintain. Okay, so in conclusion... Um, the XOR swap is not useful. It's hard to read, it's not fast, and it zeroes things when you don't want it to. <laughs> but for all of XOR swap's shortcomings, my gosh, it's clever. I heart XOR swap. See you later. Thanks for watching.